So uh, a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, um, colleagues, um, fellow doctors, uh, and other healthcare professionals who are joining us this morning. Uh, this is the next extension of the SK Dharma Lingam um, lecture series. This is the 14th of, of the series. And uh, this is an ongoing series uh, looking at um, increasing understanding, awareness, education about various cancers, especially within the primary care setting. So we're privileged and honored to have with us this morning an eminent physician, consultant hematologist, at Subang Jaya Medical Center, Dr. Alan Te uh, Dr. Alan, good morning. Hey, good morning, Dr. Thank you so Morali. much for joining us. Yeah, thank you thank for you your so much kind for words. joining us. Yeah. Oh, not at all, yeah. Dr. Always a pleasure and an honor for, so, I think for our colleagues, they, they, there should be no one in this session who does not know Dr. Alan. It's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but in case you're joining us from some other country, uh, Dr. Alan is an eminent uh, hematologist he has, I think, uh, worked in the field of hematology in Malaysia for uh, longer than, than many of us young chaps have even been doctors. Uh, so um, we're, we're with uh, Dr. Allen, what comes uh, to, to us in the sharing and the insights that he will provide us with today is uh, really a collection of not only uh, kind of the CPGs, the recommendations, but rather also the wisdom and the experience of caring for Malaysians within this setting. And uh, today, Doctor is going to speak to us about lymphomas. And um, um, admittedly, uh, we have, I think, in in the past sessions of the series, gone and looked at some of the more popular, uh, if I could use the word popular, cancers. But uh, we we th there's quite a. a, a see a number of people who are coming uh, with lymphomas and presenting and getting diagnosed with lymphomas in Malaysia as well. And often, uh, as we have discussed, this series is about getting primary care frontline colleagues, uh, the people who really see the patients first and uh, try to get them to kind of identify these patients earlier and you know, uh, push them onto the, the diagnostic and treatment pathway uh, so that you know, we can downstage the cancers that we're picking up in Malaysia. And it's with this that Dr. Allen is here to uh, speak to us a little bit today about uh, lymphomas. So without further ado, please allow me to allow Dr. Allen to take center stage. But just before that, a kind reminder to mute your microphones, your videos, and also please feel free to put up questions in the chat box, we'll address them right at the end of the first segment. And then uh, as uh, Dr. Alan goes in for the second segment and then we can take more questions right at the end of that. The session is being recorded and you will find it on YouTube uh, and in, in the NCSM kind of Facebook pages right after this as well. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Creighton, over the session to you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Morali. Indeed, the honor and pleasure is mine. So I'll let me share my slides now, yeah? Okay, so slide share all right, okay. Okay, I, so I'm very honored uh, and pleased to be given the opportunity to talk to you about uh, lymphomas. I was asked to prepare something on lymphomas and uh, especially catering for uh, GPs. I've actually given something, most of it, some slides may be sim uh, familiar to you because I did give the, the, such a similar talk to the MMA scientific meeting not that long ago. So uh, please bear with me if it's a repeat, but I have uh, edited and made some changes. And uh, this time I promise I'll speak a bit more slowly because I was, I was told I spoke too fast, but it was a very compressed talk for about 20, 25 minutes in the MMA session. So this one will have more time uh, for you and to, to digest. It's actually a very wide scope and the talk will be split into two. And I think the initial first uh, half would be, well, a bit less than half will be focusing on the approach the primary care doctor uh, should take when you see a patient with an enlarged lymph node. And then the second part would be uh, updates on lymphoma and also a little bit on lymphoma in the COVID pandemic. Okay, let's, let's get started. So, um, 
when to suspect the lymph node is malignant and when to refer, that's the first part. And second part would be updates on lymphoma management and thirdly, lymphoma in the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. So how do you evaluate uh, enlarged abnormal lymph nodes or lymphadenopathy and when do you consider these to be malignant? So lymphadenopathy can be defined as any abnormality in the size, number or character of the lymph nodes. If you can't remember the wide variety of causes, think of the acronym MIAMI, the M standing for malignancies. It can be primary malignancy of the lymph nodes, that is lymphomas, but there also could be secondaries or metastasis to the lymph nodes. Okay, so don't forget that. I for infections, most commonly in viral, but it could be bacterial, uh, including chronic infections like tuberculosis, fungal, and so on. And the other A would be for autoimmune disorders in our part of the world. Don't forget uh, common autoimmune disorders like SLE, which also can present with enlarged lymph nodes. Then the other M stands for miscellaneous and unusual uh, conditions uh, such as uh, Kikuchi's disease and other rarer causes of enlarged lymph nodes. And the last I would be for iatrogenic. Okay, some drugs, for example, phenytoin or dilantin can cause enlarged uh, lymph nodes if used for a long time. But what is most concerning to the patient who comes to you as the primary care doctor is they're worried about it might be a cancer. In uh, actual fact, the, the rate of malignancy uh, of uh, patients presenting in the primary care with an unexplained lymphadenopathy is actually quite low. But nevertheless, we don't want to miss it. So what are the tips and tricks uh, in the approach to a patient presenting with enlarged lymph nodes? And there's, not, there's no secret. I mean, the basics are still very important. You need to take a thorough history, uh, a thorough physical examination, and pay particular attention to the character of the lymph node, the size, and so on. Everything you were taught in medical school is still very relevant. Okay. So what about the history? Okay. The age of the patient, the duration of the lymph node, are particularly important in the assessment. Malignancy, I mean, it is quite obvious, would increase with age. So you would not expect to see uh, malignancy as a cause of lymphadenopathy is less likely in the young compared to the elderly. The majority of healthy children have palpable cervical inguinal axillary lymph nodes when, uh, at a young age. Okay? And most, most of them are benign or infectious in etiology. Any lymph node that lasts less than two weeks or lasts more than one year with no progression in size or increase in size have a very low likelihood of being neoplastic. So in between, that's when you consider uh, the node may be malignant. Some exceptions to the long duration rule would be very slow growing uh, cancers. Uh, the primary lymph node cancers like Hodgkin's can sometimes be quite slow. And uh, we've seen uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma pre present beyond a year of uh, lymph node enlargement. Same goes for the low grade or the more indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, uh, chronic lymphocytic le leukemia, and even some metastatic cancers like nasopharyngeal carcinoma, they can present with very long standing and large uh, lymph nodes, okay? In your history, also don't forget uh, if there's a history of uh, animal bites, uh, insect bites, any infectious contacts, especially uh, in this uh, in, in this era of pandemic, we always worry about any contacts, recurring infections, chronic use of medications, and travel-related exposures and immunization status are important because uh, you know there may be an infective cause for the uh, enlarged lymph node. Okay. Things which uh, increase the risk of cancer, such as tobacco use, alcohol use, ultraviolet radiation, etc., should be part of your history. And <laughs> occupational exposure to um, things like silicon and beryllium may cause also enlarged lymph nodes. And don't forget to take a sexual history because HIV is an important cause of 
unexplained and large limb nodes. So it all boils down to a thorough history, okay? And some other clues in the history, never forget, would be constitutional symptoms like fever, fatigue, or malaise. And especially if you see this uh, together with atypical lymphocytosis in the blood picture, you suspect a mononucleosis syndrome, okay? In patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, there may be significant fever, night sweats, and unex unexplained weight loss, especially with more than 10% of his normal weight. And these are the B, so-called B symptoms of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, uh, if you have an autoimmune disease such as SLE, dermatomyositis, then history of arthralgia, muscle weakness, unusual rash, etc., will make you suspect this group of disorders. Okay, now before we move on to the physical examination part, just a reminder of where the lymph nodes are. Okay, they're all in the various groups and chains, neck, supraclavicular, um, axilla, then the mediastinal and in, uh, intrathoracic nodes, okay, intra-abdominal, pelvic, inguinal, and don't forget the epitrochlear or supratrochlear and popliteal nodes. So in your examination for enlarged lymph nodes, it's not good enough just to palpate the neck, but you really should be palpating other areas like armpits, supratrochlear area, okay, inguinal, popliteal, and so on. And when you examine and find the lymph nodes are enlarged, don't forget also to look into the areas which drain into those lymph nodes. So your anatomy, again, is very important. So you need to say, if you see a preauricular node, you need to look at the scalp and the surrounding skin. Okay, if there are submandibular nodes, then look into the, don't forget to examine the mouth because there could be some lesion there, which is drained into the submandibular nodes and uh, so on for the cervical uh, nodes and supraclavicular nodes which I'll touch on a bit later in detail, okay? So this basic anatomy and uh, remembering where uh, they supply the lymphatic drainage, okay? Which give, may give you a clue to the cause of the enlarged lymph node. Okay, uh, enough about boring uh, theoretical stuff. Let's just show you a case uh, which I saw some years back. And this is a 22-year-old woman who was concerned about an enlarged lymph node above her elbow. Okay, two weeks ago, prior to that, she recalled being scratched by her cat and there was fever for a few days. And then when she presented, she had a tender right epitrochlear node measuring about two centimeters. Okay, she's wondering whether this is uh, cancer or something, but the history was very characteristic and I'm sure you all know what it was. The final diagnosis was uh, cat scratch disease, uh, due, which is due to an organism called Bartonella hanselae, and a simple cause of uh, macrolide antibiotics will cure this condition. Okay. Now, let's go into detail about head and neck uh, lymph adenopathy, because that's what would concern most of the patients who come to see you, okay? And... Uh, in uh, one outpatient primary care study, enlarged cervical lymph nodes, which were palpable, uh, were found in 50, about half of all adult physical illness, but the incidence declined uh, with age. Now, infection is the most common cause still. So they, they come to you worrying about some cancer, but actually infection is the most common cause. Many of these are viral, and these things resolve quite quickly. They don't usually require antibiotics or repeated causes of antibiotics, okay? Some entities can preserve, can be persistent uh, for weeks to months. And then, for example, a typical mycobacteria, cat scratch disease, toxo, kikuchi, sarcoi, kawasaki, so some of them, although they're benign, they do can, uh, they, they can persist. Of the head and neck lymph adenopathy, the supraclavicular nodes are the ones you need to pay attention to. They are the ones which are more likely to be malignant and should always be investigated, even in children. So I think if there's any take home message, please pay attention to the supraclavicular nodes, okay? The malignancy uh, rate was found to be as high as 30 to 50% in patients with supraclavicular lymph adenopathy and is highest in those above the age of 14, okay? 
if it is a right supraclavicular lymph node, the association is with cancer, where it drains, which is the lungs, uh, menisthenum, and sometimes esophagus. And in the left, okay, what you learned in medical school, the Verkhoff's node may be associated with uh, abdominal malignancy, for example, cancer of the stomach or pancreas. Okay, so in terms of metastatic disease, this is think of the drainage areas, which are a bit different from the right to the left. Of course, they could be primary malignancy in the lymph nodes themselves. So, if, for example, lymphoma can occur either in the right or left supraclavicular area. All right. Okay, now we won't be talking about all the regions, but rather than localized lymphadenopathy, uh, let's move on to generalized lymphadenopathy. So if it is generalized, these are more likely to result from serious infections, autoimmune disease, and uh, disseminated malignancy. So usually patients presenting with generalized lymphadenopathy, some specific testing is required, okay, or further investigation is required. Um, in terms of cancers, it is not that common with, uh, to see generalized lymphadenopathy, but in hematological malignancy, which is why, what I work with, it is, not, it is more common than with uh, uh, solid tumors. Hmm? We are talking about leukemias and lymphomas. Okay? But sometimes we can see disseminated metastatic uh, solid tumors presenting with generalized lymphadenopathy. But if it is malignancy, usually we are dealing with lymphomas or leukemias. When you examine the nodes, whether they are localized or generalized, any node which is hard and painless have a higher sufficiency of malignancy. Okay? Nodes which are soft, and particularly if they are tender, then that usually points to inflammatory, possibly infective. So I usually tell patients, pain is a good sign. Okay? If it's a hard, painless node, then there's not such a good sign. So in uh, young, young people, viral infection she typically produces uh, hyperplastic nodes. They are bilateral, mobile, non-tender, some by the time they present to you usually, and they're usually mobile and clearly demarcated. Okay. If they are supraclavicular or popliteal or epitrochlear of any size larger than five millimeters, they are really abnormal and would need investigation. And as, as I mentioned earlier, increasing size and persistence over time are a greater concern for malignancy than a specific level of node enlargement. Okay. So let's take you through a simple uh, algorithm for the evaluation, diagnosis, and management of uh, limb adenopathy to summarize what I've mentioned uh, earlier. Okay. So if it is localized, okay, when you see a patient presenting with a lymph node, uh, never forget it may not be a lymph node. Okay, we've uh, seen patients with uh, lumps of bumps, but patient thinks it's a lymph node, and it could be a cutaneous lump, maybe a sebaceous cyst, or even a, a, a enlarged salivary gland. Okay, so it may not even be a lymph node. So examine and look for signs of inflammation. If there is, then it is an inflamed node, lymphadenitis, think of viral or bacterial causes. Look at the anatomical site of infection. There may be a source of infection in the primary site or even a, a malignancy in the primary site. Okay. If it's suspicious, node, supraclavicular location, highly suspicious, hard, and if the node is particularly not mobile or fixed, no, it's fixed in particular, and there's progression in size and long duration, more than two weeks, Usually, these would need investigation and referral. Okay, in the neck nodes, consider ENT examination, uh, investigation, and biopsy. Okay. As for generalized lymph adenopathy, again, if the onset is very acute, measuring from days to weeks, these are usually viral. Think of EBV, okay, other viruses like adenovirus, CMV, HIV, or it could be an early presentation of autoimmune disease, okay, and possibly hematological malignancy. Chronic in, uh, onset for weeks to months, infection could still be the cause, such as HIV, TB, syphilis, don't forget or autoimmune disease or malignancy, particularly lymphomas and hematological malignancy, more common than metastatic solid tumor. 
the clinical pearl, if anything, you can take home message is, if anything is longer than two to four weeks, uncertain diagnosis, then you really need to refer and usually will need to biopsy, okay? Because that's the only certain way of establishing the diagnosis. Um, I'll just end this first uh, session on the approach to lymph, enlarged lymph node with a case example, okay? And this was referred from a GP, 16-year-old girl who had generalized lymphadenopathy for about a month and abnormal blood counts and the referral diagnosis was query lymphoma. Okay, and actually she had about one week of bloatedness in the tummy and then enlarged nodes in the neck, axilla, inguinal, okay, tonsillar, exudates. The GP did a, a monospot test for infectious mono, which was negative. She had some night sweats, was lethargic, a little bit of weight loss, okay. So the referral was query lymphoma, not sure infection. This was her blood count, hemoglobin 12.4, platelet 154, which is normal, white count, which is on the low normal side with the relative lymphocytosis, okay? And the blood film commented said there was occasional atypical lymphocyte seen. So what's the diagnosis? Lymphoma, infection. Okay, we, uh, history, we just went into detail by the time the patient came to see us was the nodes were initially painful and seems to be getting smaller now. And she did recall there was mild fever at the beginning. She had a rash, which was transient and a bit of sore throat. The tummy still feels a bit bloated and she felt very tired. There were multiple sub-centimeter nodes in the neck, the inguinal axillary region, but these were soft and mobile. Okay, there was no rash by the time I saw her. Throat looked normal, but my the clinical diagnosis was more likely to be infection rather than malignancy. Though given the, the progression, the clinical picture was very typical of infectious mononucleosis. Okay. So when we followed up the counts, they said nothing needs to be done. Please stop all antibiotics. You do not need antibiotics. This is a viral picture. Indeed, her counts subsequently normalized. The nodes regressed and disappeared, and the confirmatory absent bar virus IgM was positive. And um, we find that this is a little bit more accurate than the monospot test, where there's a high uh, degree of false uh, negative when you do the monospot. So generally prefer to do a EBV IgM, okay, if you're trying to diagnose infectious mononucleosis. All right, so I think I will, uh, Dr. Mirali, I will conclude the first half of the talk, which is actually an approach to uh, lymphadenopathy. And I'm happy to take any questions before we move on to the lymphoma proper talk of the session. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor. Um, uh, for those who have just joined us, I think the participation just went up to about 80 old people Ooh, in that short okay. time when you were speaking. So uh, well, we, we've divided the segment into two sessions and Dr. Allen was speaking currently about uh, diagnosing lymphomas. Uh, and, and the second session will dwell now into other parts of that. So for those of us who are just joining us, please feel free to put up questions. We're just having a short Q&A break. I don't see any questions as yet, but you have if you have questions, just just feel free to drop them in the chat box and then uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Well, Dr. Allen will be very happy to take them for you. Uh, there's one question already, Doctor, on where to palpate the popliteal node. It's from a colleague of ours. It's at the back of the knee. So don't forget the back of the knee, okay? That's one area we often forget when we're examining nodes. I find two areas we often forget. One is epitrochlear or supratrochlear, okay? Because, and the other one is back of the knee. Okay, we only tend to feel the neck. I think mean, when patients come to the GP, I got swelling. Okay, you feel the neck, you feel the armpits, but don't forget the supratrochlear area, uh, popliteal area. Okay, when you tap, uh, palpate the abdomen, of course, inguinal nodes. But inguinal nodes, um, almost everyone has some inguinal nodes. Uh, they, are, they are least likely to be pathological. If, if it's a choice of biopsy, if enlarged nodes, we, the last one we want to biopsy is the inguinal node because often they can be a reactive node rather than the pathological node, all right? Okay, but don't forget there are nodes other than what you can feel in the neck. Don't forget the armpit. Don't forget the supra 
the trochlear area and also probably tail. I had one patient with uh, CLL uh, with just lymph, lymph nodes all over, but he actually had very marked swelling behind his knee, which actually turned out to be enlarged popliteal nodes. And actually, we, when they're very suspicious, we actually biopsied it. And actually, the, he had a rictus transformation, which is actually a more malignant transformation of a low-grade disease to a high-grade lymphoma. So sometimes uh, they will tell you, but don't forget to examine the back of the knee. Okay. Mm. Um, I don't see anyone uh, with any more questions at this point in time. So if, if everyone is consensus, please uh, let us allow Dr. Allen to carry on first. And then, you know, at the end, we can take questions again. So if that is okay, I don't see any comments there. Doctor, are you okay with that? Shall we? Just yeah, I'm fine. I'm of, fine. Uh, yeah, I think some came late. Uh, that's okay. I think there'll be a recording. So the, the first half wasn't so much lymphoma, but the approach to lymph nodes. I hope there were some tips there, which... Uh, which uh, might be useful to you okay all right so uh, here are some updates on uh, lymphoma it's a very wide topic it's impossible to cover everything in half an hour so i'll just focus on uh, some things which might interest you and also it will be um, laced with a lot of case examples so it won't be boring um, slides survival curves uh, clinical studies and so on okay um, the top three cancers, Dr. Murali, if I'm not mistaken, uh, are still the same. Okay, this was from the cancer registry up to 2016, breast, colorectal, and lung, all right? But lymphomas, uh, although they didn't win a medal, but we are in the top 10, okay? And is the fourth most common cancer in Malaysia from at least 2012 to 2016, okay? And the incidence seems to increase with age, okay, like many other cancers. Now, it's a very, uh, like, cancer, lymphoma is not one disease. You know, it's a very heterogeneous group of diseases, okay, and uh, there's a general 80-20 rule when you're talking about lymphoma. So, about 80-85% of lymphomas are non-Hodgkin's, and about 15-20% are Hodgkin's, okay. There's a quite a lot of difference in the characteristics of Hodgkin versus non-Hodgkin. So we see Hodgkin's mostly in young adults, though there's a very small peak in the uh, later age group. Whereas non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in adults are mostly in the older age group. So about, like about 50, 60, and 70, and so on. Hodgkin's uh, tend to be localized and it tends to be spread in a contiguous fashion. That means they, they, don't, like, they don't have separate multiple multicentric node enlargement, okay? Whereas in non-Hodgkin's tends to be or quite often multicentric, okay? They don't often, Hodgkin don't often involve the throat, whereas not Hodgkin's do, okay? Uh, so I mentioned about contiguous spread in Hodgkin's versus non-contiguous spread in non-Hodgkin's, okay? Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's. B symptoms somewhat more common in Hodgkin's compared to non-Hodgkin's. Okay, the so-called pell Epstein fever more common in Hodgkin's. Pruritus more common in Hodgkin's. Okay, so there are some clinical clues which tell you which one is Hodgkin's, which one is non-Hodgkin's. All right, I will cover some updates uh, on uh, initially talking about Hodgkin's, then non-Hodgkin's, but we will cover areas of diagnosis, staging, and some aspects of uh, modern therapy, okay? Staging, uh, we still use the modified Ann Arbor staging for both uh, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay? Stage one, two, three, four. The difference between one and two and three and four would be if they are enlarged lymph nodes. If it's on both sides of the diaphragm, it's at least stage three, okay? So if it's just single lymph node group, it's stage one. If it's two or more, then it's stage two, okay? If there's dissemination beyond uh, uh, the lymph nodes to extranodal organs, uh, then it is stage four, particularly if it is special organ involvement like uh, the liver and the bone marrow, okay? Then there's also X for bulky disease, okay? The diagnosis of lymphoma is not by blood tests, it's not by scan, 
you have to advise your patients, you know, sometimes they come to us, we say, you really need the biopsy, then they run away. And then we come back to the GPs. And I think you have to advise them that you cannot run away from a biopsy. We still need a tissue diagnosis, like many types of uh, cancer. You cannot diagnose by examination, looking at a scan, even a PET scan, you cannot say it's a lymphoma. Okay, so the two key areas are still relying on histology for the diagnosis and the classification of staging, which is remain about the same. What is interesting, uh, the importance of this is somewhat different for non-Hodgkin versus Hodgkin. The histology is the one which drives the management of non-Hodgkins, okay, much more so than the stage, actually, though the staging is important. But in Hodgkin's, it's actually the staging which drives the management more so than the histology. All right. This is a general uh, statement here. Hmm? Okay, now when we are suspecting a lymphoma, we really need tissue diagnosis, as I said. So once the biopsy is decided on, we would like to biopsy the most suspicious, and usually this is the largest and the most accessible node. Okay, if it is peripherally uh, palpable, then well and good. But sometimes uh, nodes are not preferably accessible, maybe ministerial nodes or intra-abdominal like paraiotic nodes. Uh, uh, nowadays, with our very clever interventional radiologists, they can access almost every node. Even if we can't do it percutaneously, uh, some of our talented gastroenterologists can do endoscopic uh, ultrasound biopsy. Okay, So almost every node is accessible nowadays without having to open up the patient. Okay. If there's a choice of lymph nodes, I mentioned earlier, inguinal nodes tend to offer the lowest yield. And generally, the, the more pathological nodes would be the cervical nodes, supraclavical nodes, axillary nodes, and so on. And we would prefer an excisional biopsy, and I'm sure our pathology colleagues would prefer a whole node. Okay, And that would be the diagnostic procedure of choice. If the nodes are very matted and very big and difficult to excise, then a core biopsy is an alternative uh, to an excisional biopsy, okay? Now, we're not so keen on FNAC, which are more prone to false negatives and very often inconclusive results. So we still prefer a good piece of tissue, all right? Now, sometimes, uh, you know, just because the node is enlarged, uh, we may miss the diagnosis. I just want to give you an example of how a PET scan directed biopsy gave the answer. And this was a 30-year-old woman who presented with chest pain and found in another hospital to have a metastinal mass. In the other hospital, just it did a CT-guided biopsy and it was reported as a mature teratoma and referred to an oncologist. But the oncologist and the markers were negative and it was indeed rare for patients in this group to have a mature uh, teratoma. So they suggested a PET scan and when a uh, PET directed biopsy in the most metabolically, metabolic, metabolically active area in the chest, uh, it turned out to be a high-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, so sometimes a PET directed biopsy would be important. So sometimes also, as I mentioned, you know, if we have a patient with low-grade lymphoma, we do a PET scan first we may want to choose the most metabolically active area because that may point to uh, the most uh, malignant area. Sometimes it's follicular lymphoma or low-grade lymphoma, which has transformed a rickus transformation and the, the most uh, metabolically active uh, biopsy uh, would, may give you the important uh, diagnosis. Okay, I just want to share with you a patient of mine with... Uh, Hodgkins, and this is a 28-year-old who was a cigarette smoker, presented actually with ITP about four years ago. She was treated with uh, steroids, um, mycophenolate, and he fully recovered and was managed to stop all the uh, immunosuppressants. In 2020, he had a persistent cough, noted to have an elevated ESR done in the blood test with his uh, GP, and an X-ray showed he had widened metastinum, okay? So we underwent a CT-guided uh, biopsy and uh, histology actually gave us the answer. 
And these are large atypical cells, positive for CD30, CD15, okay? And, uh, and this is very typical of, uh, the whole appearance is actually very typical of a nodular sclerosing uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay? So it's important that uh, it's actually the immunohistochemistry nowadays, which needs to be done in the histopathology, not so much looking at the slides, the periods of the cell, you know, typical reed stumbled cells may not be present in the sample, but the immunohistochemistry, the profile will be important for the diagnosis. So we see, Histopathology coming from outside with just the, the HPE appearance, but no immunohistochemistry. We tell patients we need to proceed with the immunohistochemistry for a definitive diagnosis. So uh, this patient uh, underwent uh, standard uh, ABVD uh, chemotherapy for Hodgkin's. Uh, that's the appearance before treatment. And just after two cycles, we had a very good metabolic response. For those not so familiar with uh, PET scans, uh, metabolically active normal tissue like this is the heart would also light up and the brain does light up, okay? But tumor cells uh, uh, demonstrated initially have disappeared okay so this is a very good uh, metabolic response after two cycles of ABVD which has a good uh, prognostic uh, value it means these patients do well um, but more important also nowadays uh, we can actually use the PET scan uh, as a means to decide what further therapy okay so this slide will actually show you the value of what I think the, has changed the uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma management. Okay? We are able to rely on the PET CT scan for more accurate staging. Old historical textbooks will tell you staging for lymphoma may even involve laparotomy and so on, but that's many, many years ago. We've not had to do that. Now. And now in the era of PET CT scans, we are able to more accurately stage the patient. And not only that, we are able to accurately assess the response, okay? Uh, we are not able to not just see the nodes disappear, but we're able to see that there's a complete metabolic response. And now we are in the era of using the PET response to, to adapt our treatment. So what happens in early stage lymphoma, we are able to actually reduce the number of cycles and just follow up with a bit of consolidation radiotherapy and the cure rates are very, very high in early stage Hodgkin's lymphoma rather than go through full six cycles of uh, chemotherapy. In advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma, there is a choice of therapy. Uh, many uh, hematologists would still use ABVD even in advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, simply because this regimen is less uh, toxic than the more aggressive regimen, like the German b regimen, which has more uh, hematological suppression and very high level of uh, infertility after b -corp. And don't forget, these Hodgkin's patients are often young adults, so infertility is a problem and, uh, and not an insignificant uh, percentage of secondary or long-term malignancies. Although b -corp in advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma gives a better lymphoma-free survival than ABVD. That means if you treat ABVD, many patients will relapse if they are advanced. However, the reason why people still do, in those who have relapsed, you can still rescue relapse cases with second-line chemotherapy and autologous bone marrow transplant. So it's still a toss-up between ABVD and b -corp. But nowadays, there's another option. There's AAVD, where a drug called Etcetris has replaced uh, bleomycin in the regimen. And uh, Etcetris is an anti antibody drug conjugate. And uh, the drug is, uh, the scientific name is Brentuximab Vidotin. So Brentuximab is an anti-CD30 antibody, monoclonal antibody combined with a chemotherapy agent and is a, presents a targeted uh, uh, approach to chemotherapy. It's much less toxic than BCOM and uh, gives uh, superior results to ABVD in terms of uh, lymphoma-free survival. Okay, So there are various options in advanced 
Hodgkin's, but we like early stage. We can also use a pet adapted strategy, either one of escalation or de-escalation after two cycles of whatever we choose. Okay, so here's an example uh, uh, we treated, and that's a 29-year-old Malay lady who presented with very advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma in January 2019. Uh, we opted to use BCOP, and after initial therapy with BCOM. So this is a de-escalation. That means start with something intensive, then with a aim to de-escalate after a good interim PET scan result. And uh, she remained in PET uh, scan. Uh, uh, she was in remission for unfortunately only 11 months. And uh, you know after 11 months, she relapsed in the supra uh, left supraclavicular node and uh, superior mediastinal node, okay? So what are the uh, salvage options or rescue options for this patient who has relapsed uh, after uh, BCOP stroke ABVD chemotherapy? Uh, it has a good uh, salvage rate and most people would still use standard chemotherapy such as ICE or uh, DHAP. Uh, this is a... Uh, Iphosomide, uh, carboplatin, topocide. This is dexamethasone, high dose RSC, and platinum based chemo. Okay. A, the other option may be the use of uh, etcetris or brentaximab bidoctin, plus or minus uh, some amount of standard chemotherapy like bendamustine. And in the, if they are chemo sensitive, they go on to autologous transplant. So uh, again, bentaximab vidontin, targeted therapy in this modern era, which is an anti-CD30 antibody drug conjugate. Okay. So what happened? We gave her two cycles of ice, absolutely failed to respond. We gave one cycle of bendamustine, very poor response. The nodes didn't move at all. You can see before, after, not much change. Okay. Some got better, some got worse. So what to do? We are stuck, you know. But there's a third line treatment available or fourth line treatment and actually the use of checkpoint inhibitors, okay? And uh, luckily, she responded to uh, pembrolizumab, which you've heard, may have heard. No? Uh, the other one is nivolumab. So pembrolizumab is a checkpoint inhibitor, which is the form of immunotherapy using your body's own T cells to uh, attack the tumor. And she actually achieved a very, very good response after we added Pembrolizumab. It's very important in the salvage or rescue of uh, relapsed Hodgkin's lymphoma to get a very good response because we know in studies uh, for transplanted patients with uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, achieving PET negativity prior to transplant actually makes a big difference to the uh, cure rate. So these are the PET negative patients who managed to go through a transplant versus those who still were PET best positive at the time of transplant. And the, the survival rate is much, much higher compared to those who were PET positive, okay? So post, so this lady has had a very good outcome uh, until today. So post autologous transplant, she remained in complete metabolic remission. And there's a study uh, which showed that if we give maintenance with brentuximab, we don't think it reduces the lymphoma uh, relapse rate post transplant. So she's received it and has uh, stopped her maintenance and to this day has remained well. And we hope that she continues to remain well because she's been a rather difficult Hodgkin's patient to, to manage. Okay, so that's uh, uh, what... I'm going to talk about uh, Hodgkin's. We just move on to non-Hodgkin's. So again, there's another uh, 2080 rule that 80% uh, of non-Hodgkin's, of lymphomas are non-Hodgkin's, about 15, 20% are Hodgkin's. And the other 80, 20% rule is that uh, the, the, we can divide them into indolent and aggressive. In, in, in the Asia, we see about 80% of lymphomas as a more aggressive type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and about 20% are the indolent type. Okay, and it's a very heterogeneous group for both indolent and aggressive. So it's, it's, there's no time to go into everyone, but the indolent ones, the common ones we see 
are the follicular lymphomas, uh, marginal zone lymphomas, uh, mental cell lymphomas, which are a little bit semi-aggressive sometimes. Okay, the uh, very aggressive ones. There's a very uh, large waste paper basket here called the diffuse large B cell non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Then there's a very aggressive type like Burkitt's and lymphoblastic and so on. We can also split up the non Hodgkin's into B cell versus T cell based on their cell of origin. And it will be very important because uh, we can select targeted treatment based on whether it's B cell or T cell. Again, it's a 80 20 rule, it still applies. About 80% of the non Hodgkin's we see are B cell, and a minority, about 20%, are. T cell in at least in our part of the world. So, for example, of uh, examples of targeted treatment depending on the cell or origin, we can choose monoclonal antibodies which are uh, directed against the B cell targets, such as uh, the CD20 uh, uh, receptor. So, we we took CMAP. Obedient to zoom map will work against CD20. There's another B cell marker called the CD79. So there's a new uh, antibody drug conjugate called Polar to zoom map. Well, these are all long words, a big mouthful. But don't worry, at the end of the talk, I'll give you a secret cheat sheet now, to understand how the, the terminology here. Polar to zoom map for uh, non B cell, non Hodgkin's lymphoma. There are less options for T cell lymphoma, but Bentuximab, remember, is an anti. CD30 uh, drug, antibody drug conjugate. Uh, in anaplastic T cell lymphoma, also richly express CD30. So we can use bentuximab in this type of lymphoma. So we need to have a good histological diagnosis. And so, as I said, what drives the, uh, the treatment of non Hodgkin's lymphoma is the histology. Okay, the staging is much more important in Hodgkin's. And um, the, the histological subtype also aids a lot in the uh, prognostication. And uh, even for diffuse large B cell, which is a very waste paper basket, we are able to further refine the uh, histological diagnosis. We are able to categorize these into germinal center type non-Hodgkin's uh, diffuse large B cell versus the activated B cell group. Now, the activated B cell ones are have poorer prognosis compared to the germinal center one. And we also are able to get the pathologist to do fish uh, studies. And uh, we can see uh, certain uh, translocations. If we see them, they are bad. Uh, if they are too uh, like, uh, uh, bad translocations, we call them double expressors. And if they are three, then they're triple expressors. And these patients need more aggressive treatment than the standard r -chop you may have heard of for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So it's not that uh, B diffuse large B cell means r -chop for everybody. It's changed uh, since then. We are able to prognosticate better. So maybe for ABC subtypes, uh, certainly for the double expressors and so on, we need something more aggressive than r -chop. Okay, let me take you with a real life, a real world example. And this is a 30 year old woman who presents with generalized lymphadenopathy for six months. So remember what I said, generalized usually would need further investigation. Right? But she was seen by another physician who was, and she, he was thought, she was thought to have Kikuchi's disease, which is a benign disorder and treated with steroids. After this, there was a response, but after the steroids were stopped, the notes recurred, and that's when the physician got worried and referred over. So we said we needed a good biopsy, and uh, excision biopsy of a cervical node showed that she had a follicular B cell lymphoma, which is an indolent type of lymphoma. And uh, she, on the PET scan, she had nodes in the neck, and although it doesn't show, it's actually very bulky in the right side in the left armpit as well. So she had nodes in the neck, armpit, axilla, there's a little bit here in the upper periotic region. And actually she had nodes in guinum as well. So she had stage three disease because it's on both sides of the diaphragm. So in early stage, like stage one, you could use radiotherapy with or without a monoclonal antibody against CD20. And actually some proportions may actually be cured. The paradox about indolent lymphoma versus aggressive is we tell patients very hard to cure, especially in advanced stage. 
um, they tend to relax. Indeed, if patients with advanced stage follicular lymphoma are very asymptomatic, nodes are small, we may opt to watch and wait. If they become symptomatic, if they have bulky disease, that's when they will need treatment. Okay, they can easily go into remission, but we need to watch them because there is a tendency to relapse over time. So the choice of uh, treatment nowadays with symptomatic uh, follicular lymphoma would be a monoclonal antibody directed against CD20, which is the B-cell expression, with some form of chemotherapy. And uh, nowadays, uh, we can have a choice of RB or GB. R stands for uh, rituximab. Mm -hmm. uh, and B is a single agent chemotherapy called bendamustine, which is a remarkably old chemotherapy agent which came out of East Germany, resurrected and found to be very useful in lymphoma with surprisingly not very severe side effects. So we don't see very minimal hair loss, very little vomiting and so on. Gaziva or obitumumab is a newer generation anti-CD monoclonal antibody combined with bendamustine seems to give uh, better lymphoma free survival than RB. Okay, so nowadays we prefer to use, use GB, gaziva bendamustine. And uh, r -chop is still used by some uh, physicians or RCVP, which is a little bit less aggressive, maybe in more old or frail patients who cannot tolerate the anthocycline, maybe because of cardiac issues. Maintenance uh, is important in follicular lymphomas, and we do maintain such patients with mon uh, monoclonal antibodies against CD20 for about two years, post uh, six cycles of whatever we choose. Okay, So this patient has done very well, and uh, she actually went into complete metabolic remission and is planned for uh, maintenance. But uh, we actually defer the maintenance a bit because of COVID. So I'm going to talk about what we need to do okay, in patients with lymphoma in the COVID era. Uh, final case example is the one I mentioned earlier where we did the repeat biopsy in the most metabolically active area. And instead of the so-called mature teratoma she had, uh, it was a high-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Actually, the PET scan showed she had only medicinal disease. So this, this uh, is now classified as a primary B medicinal lymphoma and uh, typically seen in the young women for some reason. And they respond wonderfully well to a regimen called dose, called dose adjusted EPOC, okay? The acronym is similar to CHOP, but with uh, additional E there for etoposide. And uh, R is with tuximab. The difference is this is a five-day continuous uh, infusion regimen. So it's actually quite uh, exhausting for the patient because they need to stay in hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a more prolonged uh, uh, kind of regimen and quite intensive, myelosuppressive too, and always needs growth factor support. But the cure rates and response rates are, are very high, well above 90%. And many do not need consolidation radiotherapy, which is a problem in young women because we don't want to irradiate the chest as far as possible. Okay. And I just want to sh show you there are other therapies for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's not just antibody, chemo. Okay. In relapse, very similar to Hodgkin's, uh, we do also autologous uh, uh, hemo uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant. And uh, in relapse or recurrent follicular lymphoma or relapse aggressive lymphoma, we will salvage them. And just like Hodgkin's, if they are very responsive, then we go on to transplant. If they are not responsive, then transplant will likely fail. So again, selecting the chemo responsive group to be transplanted may cure some of them. Okay. Occasionally, we do upfront autologous transplant in selected very aggressive or highly aggressive lymphomas, for example, uh, Burkitt's lymphoma or the primary CNS lymphoma. Most of the time, we will perform upfront, upfront autologous transplant because these patients end up with a higher percent of cure rate rather than do it in the salvage uh, scenario. Whereas in other types of lymphoma, upfront transplant is not so 
well proven to improve the cure rates. We, we prefer, we may be transplanting patients unnecessarily. So we will wait unless they relapse, then only we transplant such uh, patients, okay? There are emerging options uh, to patients who have become relapsed or become refractory to standard chemotherapy. So I just want to mention some of them. Uh, there are the immunomodulatory uh, drugs, uh, such as lenalidomide, which is a newer generation thalidomide, which you may have heard of. Okay, combined with drugs like rituximab, uh, has an activity against uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Then there are small molecule inhibitors. Okay, these are very popular in treatment of uh, CLL and also indolent lymphomas, the Bruton kinase inhibitors. Uh, like ibrutinib and BCL2 inhibitors like venetoclax have been used in uh, CLL and uh, lymphomas, like mental cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma. Then there are newer antibody drug conjugates, so antibody combined with uh, chemotherapy, such as uh, polatuzumab for relapsed refractory non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Then I showed you the a uh, patient who failed everything but responded to immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors, okay, like uh, uh, pembrolizumab. Okay. And then there's uh, emerging uh, CAR T cell therapy. Okay, CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. So these are actually genetically engineered receptors. We take the patient's T lymphocytes. Uh, we get some virus to transfect a gene which will manufacture an artificial receptor on the surface of the T cell, which will target the tumor or the lymphoma. Okay, so this is CAR T cell therapy. And uh, I'm sorry if the slide is uh, it's a bit low down there. There are the bites or by specific T cell engagers. Okay, this drug. Uh, it's worked similarly in principle to CAR T cell therapy. We have the drug will bind to the lymphoma cell, one end, and it will bind to the T cell, the other end, bring the T cell to the tumor, so to speak. So, okay, these are termed as bi-specific uh, T cell engagers. So, these are some of the emerging options we have for uh, relapsed refractory non-Hodgkin's lymphoma today. So I'm going to end um, my talk quite shortly. Uh, so we we'll save more time for Q and A. So what are the take home points I have for you? Uh, you know, I hope it, I made it clear when you should recognize when lymph adenopathy requires referral for further investigation and management, okay? So you take your history, the clues are from your history, your examination, uh, and uh, character, the node, the size, whether it's localized, generalized, etc. Okay, and importance always of uh, accurate diagnosis, and we cannot run away from biopsy. It's something you need to advise patients because time and time again they're so scared they don't have a biopsy, and we need a good histopathologist. And uh, a report just with uh, HPE report is inadequate. Okay, we want a good report with immunohistochemistry to mark the tumor carefully and to type and tell us what type is it lymphoma and what type of lymphoma. And I highlight to you the importance and the usefulness of a PET CT scan. Uh, you know, PET CT scans uh, used to be very rare. I remember very early in my career when PET CT was first available, we could, had to send the patient to Hong Kong. It cost an arm and a leg to do a PET CT. Then it was available in Singapore. And finally, it's available a large concentration of PET scanners in Klang Valley, okay? But it's also available up in Penang, it's available in Johor, okay? Unfortunately, not so well much in the East Coast and East Malaysia, but it is available in Malaysia today. And it's extremely important for the staging, the evaluation response, and in, at least in the case of Hodgkin's lymphoma, we can modify treatment based on the PET scan response, okay? So the take-home therapy, you need to understand and also educate your patients that people are scared. Lymphoma therapy is not just chemotherapy. We are almost always would use some form of targeted and indeed sometimes novel treatment. All the B-cell lymphomas would have some form of monoclonal antibody. 
Okay, uh, we are using increasingly antibody drug conjugates like brentuximab in Hodgkin's lymphoma, and there are emerging therapies like I mentioned, the imids like lenalidomide, small molecule inhibitors, and they're all available to us checkpoint inhibitors. CAR T cell therapy is not widely available. Uh, I mean, it's just very very early days in Malaysia. Uh, there's an ongoing ongoing clinical trial in HUKM. Okay, and, uh, and they are also available in Malaysia by specific T cell antibodies if need be. Okay, these are just some novel salvage therapy for the very resistant non Hodgkin's lymphoma. I didn't put it here, but in people who have relapsed autolog after autologous transplant, we do sometimes also allogenic transplant where we select a match uh, donor as a second transplant in patients who are eligible. Okay. Ah, here's the cheat sheet I wanted to uh, show you uh, because the names are so uh, long and confusing even to some of us. So uh, I think Dr. Morali would recognize this one. I showed this in one of the earlier uh, public talks, but I've modified a little, made one addition where I think the person has missed out. Let's start with the bottom here. Monoclonal antibody. So there is a prefix, substem and stem in the generic naming formula for you to understand. Huh? So if it is a uh, mo map, it means the antibody came from a mouse. Okay, so like polar, uh, for for example, if it is uh, uh, what is the moment? If the uh, blina two mo map. Okay, that is the um, bite uh, bite uh, antibody that is coming from a mouse. Okay, when it's Two means it targets a tumor. So being a two more map, okay, it's a tumor targeted produced by a mouse antibody. If it is a Z map, means it's a chimeric human mouse antibody. So we took C map, TU for tumor. C map is actually we took C map is actually a chimeric human mouse antibody. If it is a uh, fully humanized, then it is a mu map. So for example, uh, uh, Obina map is a CD20 humanized antibody. If it is a zoo map, a two zoo map, then it's a humanized mouse antibody. So, for example, polar two zoo map is a ND70, CD79 humanized mouse antibody. All right, and here are some examples written down here are uh, my oncology colleagues who use more, and I'm not very familiar with them, like Bevacizumab. Ipilitumumab and Cetuximab according to whatever targets, okay? So CI would be circulatory, LI with immune system, and then TU, tumor. And the end there, Zumab, Mumab, Zmab, Momab, depending on whether it's humanized, fully humanized, or chimeric, or murine. Then the small molecules, the ones I'm more familiar will be the TNIPs, okay? They really stand for tyrosine, kinase in the uh, inhibitor, okay, such as uh, sunitinib, okay, imartinib for uh, CML, okay, uh, ruxolitinib, uh, ibrutinib, these are all tyrosine kinase inhibitors. If it is a zomib, then it's a proteasome inhibitor like bodizomib we use to treat in multiple myeloma, cyclip, PARIPs, rofenips, uh, CDK, PARP, BRAF inhibitors are more used by my oncology colleagues. So this is a cheat sheet, okay? I uh, hope it gives you that it's actually a method to the madness in naming all these long, long, unpronounceable names. Okay, then last, last slide, I promise, okay? Lymphoma in the con COVID pandemic, all right? Uh, what has uh, we? What have we had to do uh, to modify our strategies in the COVID uh, era, which is still ongoing? Um, we have to balance whatever myelosuppressive treatment versus the infectious risk of uh, COVID nineteen. So when we can delay treatment, and sometimes we can delay treatment in the uh, lymphoma, if the patients, we anticipate that the patients can remain well and stable. Okay, I had a patient with a mental cell lymphoma, was advised our job, but for, he had also recent uh, ischemic heart disease and angioplasty and was concerned about undergoing treatment. And that was end of last year. So I said that you're right in a roaring pandemic, it is okay to defer because mental cell lymphoma does not need 
it's not life threatening straight away. He just had some small lymph nodes in the neck, and uh, he was well otherwise. So we say we could wait. Uh, at least get off your double antiplated agents and then we watch you. In fact, he has remained very well for more than six months without any signs of progression. And uh, in the meantime, we said we would, when the vaccines come out, we want you to be vaccinated. In fact, he managed to get his uh, uh, vaccine first. And now that he's off an anti -du uh, dual antiplated agent, he's been vaccinated and now is the time to actually consider myelosuppressive treatment like r chop chemotherapy, and so on. Okay, so we can delay sometimes depending on the type of treatment and we need to balance against the need to vaccinate and uh, protect the patients against COVID-19. We can also reduce clinic visits and we use a lot of it during this uh, uh, pandemic era. My telemedicine usage has... Uh, gone parabolic, you know. So almost every day of the weekday, I have some telemedicine sessions and this actually helps us manage uh, patients who do not have to come to hospital. Either they have some query, they need some counseling, they need some follow-up blood counts. They can do this remotely without having to travel so much. Okay, in the early days, uh, when the MCO was very restrictive, could not even travel into the district, for instance. So actually this has helped uh, reduce uh, hospital visits and help the patients uh, tremendously. We are able to shorten the duration of treatment when they come to hospital. If they need a prolonged infusion, when there is a subcutaneous uh, option, for instance, we are able to uh, uh, offer that to patients. For, in, for instance, in, when there's rituximab, nowadays there is a subcutaneous formulation of rituximab. So instead of a prolonged intravenous infusion, they come, they have a 20 minute subcutaneous injection, then they can go back. So, so shorter duration of treatment equals shorter hospital time helps. The use of other supportive treatment like GCSF and so on to reduce the infection risk against bacteria, fungus, it, it goes on in the COVID pandemic area because we don't want them to be uh, ill, end up in hospital and so on. In the case of vaccination, I mean, we prefer this when they're off active chemotherapy, immunotherapy. For B-cell depleting therapy, you know, particularly the rituximab or gaziva therapy, it depletes the CD20 and they will have no response to the COVID vaccine if you give it for less than six months from the last dose of these uh, CD20 depleting therapy. So we tell the patients if they are on it, we need to delay. So my patient who had the follicular lymphoma went into complete pet metabolic response. I think we talk and say, look, we delay for six months get your COVID vaccination and after vaccination, go on maintenance. So I think that's the plan for her and she should be uh, vaccinated anytime and going off uh, on uh, maintenance after that. So uh, thank you. I will be happy to take your questions. Uh, you, if you have questions after the talk, you can scan my contact here uh, as a QR code. This is not your, uh, for your CBD points. Huh? This is just to my contact. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, doctor. I'm trying to... Uh, okay, so we've got you back on... Uh, uh, we've got you back on Spotlight. Uh, uh, Actually, screen is off, huh? Yeah, okay. Ah, okay, yes, doctor. Uh, and uh, what we're trying to do is uh, take some questions, doctor. Thank you very much for that session. Uh, I think it was very insightful. And what I always like from listening to your sessions is uh, how you always share with us at uh, all these different levels, how do we actually manage our patients? Doctor, a couple of questions, if you're okay to take them. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, doctor, first question is... Um, so there's a question on what is meant by a checkpoint inhibitor? Uh, what is a checkpoint? One of our colleagues asks. Okay, this is a form of uh, immunotherapy. All right. So what, it happen, what happens in uh, checkpoint inhibition, it, it uh, releases the 
and leash, let's put it in lay, layman's term, the way I look at it is uh, unleashes your, your immune system uh, onto your cancer cells. Okay, so um, there are sort of gatekeeping uh, proteins called checkpoints, which, uh, in, which prevents your, your immune system from being too strong. Okay, and if you can inhibit these checkpoints, it will enhance the ability for your T cells to kill the cancer cell. Uh, that's in very simplistic uh, terms. Okay, and uh, the proteins which uh, inhibit the, uh, uh, the the checkpoint proteins found on T cells uh, include the you may have heard of these uh, PDL one or PD one. Okay, so we often sometimes look for expression of PD1 or PDL1 in the tumor cells to know whether or not uh, uh, immune checkpoint inhibition will work. For Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's almost all will have uh, be rich uh, in uh, PDL1 expression, but in non Hodgkin's lymphoma, we will check. Uh, we we'll ask the histo histopathologist to check whether there is a PDL1 expression, and then maybe about 30% would express it. Then we can try the expen otherwise it's expensive therapy. We don't blindly give uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors to uh, these hematological patients. Okay. They are also used for, for other cancer therapy. I'm sure Dr. Morali will be uh, more familiar. Mm. Got it, Doctor. Um, next, there's a question on what is the cure rate of Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in general with the more modern modes of treatment? Okay, we are able nowadays to estimate, okay, they are based on a lot of uh, factors, not just, uh, we cannot say it is, there's no one uh, cure rate. And I think we will need to look at uh, various prognostic uh, factors for follicular lymphoma. Uh, we'd say they are basically incurable because they, they will inevitably re relapse sometimes after 10, 15 years, but it's common to relapse. They, they basically have to, they are converting their lymphoma into a chronic illness. They live to it. If they relapse, we retreat. Okay, but there is a, a you can calculate uh, their, how they will do well in terms of what is the remission rate and overall survival rate with various uh, prognostic index. Can I share the screen again? I just want to... Yes, please do, Doctor. Uh, hang on. Huh? So for follicular lymphoma, there is the flippy index, okay? So that's the Follicular Lymphoma International Prognostic Index. So we can punch in the characteristic of the patient, such as the age, okay, how many involved, how many nodal groups are involved, okay, uh, whether or not the LDH which is involved uh, is elevated. So that's for both non hodge for both aggressive and non hodgkins LDH is a uh, important prognostic factor. What is the uh, hemoglobin level at time of presentation and the stage? So we can put in the variables here, and then they will come out at the uh, calculate for you the flippy score and tell you the approximate uh, survival over the years. Okay, the equivalent for this in uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is the revised uh, international prognostic rate uh, uh, index. Let me see if I can find it. MD Chalk is quite a good site. Uh, I use it all the time. So, uh, international. Oh, here we go. So, the, the revised uh, IPI is the uh, same thing, similar to the Flippy, and that is used for the aggressive, more aggressive one. The, diffuse, the, more, the most common is the diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So again, it is age, stage, and here the performance status is also a variable and an LDH and the involvement of extra nodal site. So you punch in again, and then the, the, there's a score which will come out to tell you the, uh, the progression free survival and so on. So you can actually predict, but so it really depends on the individual patient you're dealing with. But generally, if you are very old, frail, more advanced than the cure rate drops. But if early stage, younger, okay, low LDH, then the cure rate is high. We are talking about generally, even though the cure rate is not there, but 
Bear in mind, the res initial response rate for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uniformly is very high. We're talking about 80, 90% of patients will respond to initial therapy. It's just that the more advanced ones are the ones which tend to relapse. But even if it relapsed, there is a option to still cure some of them. Uh, for example, we are talking about the ability to give a second line treatment and then follow up by autologous transplant because not everyone is eligible because... Uh, obviously, you can't do that for the very old or frail patients, especially those with comorbidities. So it 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 uh, uh, it is very individualized. We cannot uh, have a general statement. Okay, but I hope I can tell you what are the tools we have now to be able to tell uh, patients for uh, what their chances are and so on. Absolutely. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor, there's a, a question on the cheat sheet. Uh, so the colleague asks, what do the alphabets NIP stand for? I think it's I, the TNIP, T-I-N-I-B is something. Ah, T-I-N-I-B. Like yeah, I think it's more like in, in, in inhibitor. I think it's something close to inhibitor as far as I know. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a cheat sheet for me also okay. because it's a wonderful cheat sheet. Otherwise, there's also long, long names which um, we all never encountered in medical school. I don't know when you were in medical school, how many decades ago. These drugs never existed. Then they started, uh, you know, coming out of the labs and then, you know, and then we are all inundated with all these long, long names. At least the cheat sheet will tell you there is some, some, Classification to all these better uh, to the madness, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you're right. you know, some of these names are so wrong. Yeah. I prefer, I prefer the trade name, you know, compared trade to, names. Is it, is it Gaziva instead of OB2 number map? <laughs> Can't even pronounce it. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, doctor. Doctor, yeah. um, I, I, I think we're still waiting on some questions, but I had uh, one to mm. kind of elaborate on, and if you could strengthen mm. this for yeah. a lot of us. Um, mm. You spoke about this uh, slightly earlier about uh, when you're talking to patients and you're like trying to get them to go uh, to see a consultant from primary care and moving on mm. forwards. Mm. One of the things that patients will always ask you is, okay, what's, what's, that, what's that doctor going to do to me? And generally, you know, mm. we speak to them about other uh, uh, diagnostic tests. We talk about a biopsy, but there's always a kind of challenge when you talk to them about immunohistochemistry. But I ask you for some insights on when you discuss with your patients, like uh, what are the kind of like tips or important points that you want to put across uh, to your patient to kind of convince them that, look, this is an important test to do. It's worth that expenditure. Yeah. Now, sometimes, in fact, quite often, we get patients referred from multiple centers and uh, the biopsy report is there. They come with the report. And uh, I think if they have been counseled right at the beginning from the primary doctor who had seen, because you look at it, the report with just some histopathology uh, conclusion without or very little immunohistochemistry, we know that's inadequate. And if the patient comes all the way far, like from Johor or somewhere, and they come to us and say, oh, we need immunohistochemistry. If they have been yeah. counseled, actually, they could have come with not just a report, but they could have come with the tissue block or even unstained right. slides, you know, from the initial doctor who made the diagnosis. Come with that, and then we, we will advise the patient, you do not need a rebiopsy, but the pathologist can use the material and run the immunohistochemistry to number one. We always, as far as possible, try to get a second opinion, you know, in, in terms of the histopathology is what drives the treatment of non hodgkins lymphoma. So if we get it wrong, we are getting wrong treatment. So we got to get it right and we have to make sure that they have immunohistochemistry nowadays. We cannot do without it. So if it is not available, they must, they should come with the tissue block and slides. So that will save a lot of time. You know, I think uh, that's right. what absolutely. we need to advise the Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Got it, doctor. I think that's that's a really good point to share with people, especially those coming from smaller centers, uh, to kind of remind them to, hey, look, just get a get a set of unstained slides and bring it along when you're coming out to to see uh, tertiary uh, in a tertiary setting so that can be done very quickly. I'm just checking to see if there's any more questions, Doctor. At this point in time, uh, I don't see any more questions. I'm just going to leave it for another 30 seconds if there's any colleagues who are typing. Oh, okay, there I see one already. Uh, uh, Doctor, there's one. What is the role for BMT and SCT in HL and NHL overall? I think I said, you, you uh, did yeah, uh, mention about it. Yeah. Yeah. 
First of all, uh, we seldom do bone marrow nowadays. We prefer peripheral blood stem cells. So we use the term HSCT as to cover everything. Uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplantation. The reason why we seldom do a bone marrow, you know, the bone marrow transplant means you actually put the patient, in this case it's autologous, so it's the patient himself goes under general anesthesia, then we aspirate, you know, about 1,000 mils of bone marrow and then keep it for cryopreservation. We used to do this, uh, we stopped doing this for more than a decade now. Mm -hmm. And it's so much better and easier to get the hemopoietic stem cells from the peripheral blood. And we do this by mobilizing the peripheral blood on the back of growth factors, high dose growth factors or chemotherapy and then growth factors and be able to collect it from the blood using cell separators or plasma, uh, not, not plasma, I mean uh, uh, apheresis and collect the cell separators. It's an outpatient procedure in the blood bank and be able to cryopreserve these stem cells. Once we get enough, then we can do the transplant, which is basically high, very high dose chemotherapy. And then we reinfuse the hemopoietic stem cells back into them. And they, after about 10 days to two weeks post-infusion, they recover. It's a three-week stay in hospital. Okay? It is not a joyride. It's high-dose chemo. They do get severe mucositis. They may need TPN, morphine for pain relief, antibiotics for fever, blood support, and so on. Now, we generally do... This only for patients with Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's who have relapsed, okay? So in a relapse setting and provided they, they do respond to treatment in the, response, in the relapse setting and then when they're very responsive, that means when they go into second remission, that's when we transplant them because studies have shown uh, if you just leave it as second line chemotherapy, once it relapse, they will inevitably relapse again. Whereas if you treat with chemotherapy, respond, and then transplant, some of them can actually be cured. Okay, Not everyone, but at least there's a much higher cure rate combined compared to if you just treat with second-line chemo alone. So that may change in the future with novel agents. We do not know, but this is still the standard of care. Okay. Right. Got it, doctor. Doctor, and I had another question on, uh, and this is really for those who are in between uh, treatments, they're still on maintenance and they kind of pick up your average like cough and cold, you know, uh, gastroenteritis, this kind of things. So for, for a lot of us who are in primary care, there's always this very uh, low index of, uh, uh, how to say, willingness to manage, I think is the, is the term for it. And uh, sometimes the patient finds it very difficult to, you know, come back to a tertiary center and all that. What, what would be it, like your thoughts on like, um, when is the point at which when this person's or maintenance is turning up with some URTI or, you know, AGE or something like that, when, when is the point at which, you know, manage and then at this point, you know, don't manage it anymore, let them go into a tertiary setting. Any thoughts on this, Dr. A lot of it is liaison with your the specialist and the primary caregiver, isn't it? I think, you know, where in doubt, always ask. If you need help, ask for help. And I think uh, in this day and age, I keep telling my colleagues everywhere in our forums and so on, communication is so important, but we need to communicate in a secure manner. And I actually uh, shared my... Can I share one more time? Oh, yes, please. please. Doctor, feel free, doctor. We have a contact uh, yeah. here, and actually, if you scan that and go to my contact page, there is actually a link to secure messaging uh, called Silo, which I've uh, oh. I talked in a few times. I think the last two with the Academy of uh, Medicine uh, sort of uh, Surgeons uh, talk. I they mentioned that Silo is a secure messaging which all doctors can sign up and use for free. It's similar to WhatsApp. Try not to use WhatsApp for, for patient care discussion because WhatsApp is social media, really. You know, in a Facebook, we're going to catch all the, gather all your data on that. These are your patient's name, details, etc. I mean, we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, for compliance uh, sake, do something very secure. In fact, when I reply referrals to GPs, I always try to put a silo, but I think hardly anybody bothers to use it. 
but he actually is a very useful person. Yeah. Uh, I, I think if all of us are connected in some way, there's no hesitancy. If the patient comes to you and you need to inquire with the specialist, I feel we, we, we need better networking, you know. Of course, the traditional way of picking up the phone, calling hospital, and then, but, you know, it takes time. Sometimes you can't reach us directly and so on. And nobody wants uh, to be disturbed by phone calls so much. It's very disruptive in the middle of seeing patients, etc. So text messaging is very useful. Secure text messaging. Don't need to reveal your mobile number. Use silo, S-I-I-L-O. Okay, take home message. You all stop what you're doing after your this talk and go and sign up with Silo. You don't know how to sign silo. up with Silo. Go to my link there and there's a Silo link and you click on it. If you are not signed on, you will be able to uh, sign up, you know, taken to Silo. You can find Silo in the App Store or the Google Play Store. So actually communicate. A lot of uh, Malaysian doctors now are coming onto Silo. They see the light. Uh, don't use WhatsApp. Uh. <laughs> Take home message. Uh, uh, texting is so easy. You know, I'm now patients, uh, I mean, doctors who are able to, uh, you know, to and fro uh, discuss and we give feedback. So if you have in uh, constant contact with the primary caregiver, with the specialist, you know, whoever it is, constant contact. I mean, this era of writing letters, sending you the feedback, of course, you can get it one, two weeks, three weeks later. It's not real time. And then if the patient sees you unwell, we can reassure you, oh, he doesn't need anything, treat like you would, or, or oh, he's got a fever. No, I anticipate he'll be neutropenic. No, you need to come back to the hospital. All these things, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the tools are there nowadays. Huh? For patients, uh, we always give them telemedicine options uh, because we say if you need, you have any concern, you can uh, you can use their various telemedicine tools you know, out there for the patients themselves to reach out to us. Okay, I mean these we learn these things in, in because of the pandemic, you know. In the, uh, I think we, uh, but we have the tools. We should make use of them, and uh, of course. They, they may not totally replace a traditional phone call, email, or whatever, but they're there, okay? So silo for secure messaging for doctors, huh? please don't forget, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's, I think, one of the more important uh, points we should all take home today to really go and sign up. Uh, doctor, there's one more question, if you can, if you're okay to take that. Sure. Okay, uh, doctor, this is for, for a stage four non-Hodgkin's uh, indolent survivor. What is the survival rate and what are symptoms or signs to look out for in case of any relapse? Um, is it that after about five years of no relapse, it can be considered this or this person can be considered as being cancer free? Please advise. And so as I mentioned, uh, well, it depends on what type of indolent lymphoma. There are many types. Uh, uh, common ones, commonest one is a follicular B cell lymphoma, but there's also the like small lymphocytic type, which is sim which is akin to CLL. Then there's marginal zone and so on. So um, let's say assume this is a follicular B cell. Now we don't like we can't use the word cure for follicular B cell lymphoma because patients can relapse even 10, 15, 20 years down the line. But if you are one who is stage four and uh, cancer-free at five years, they've done very well, uh, but they still need to be followed up because there's still a chance of recurrence. Compared, you know, paradoxically, if you have an aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and if it's actually beyond five years of therapy and you're lymphoma-free, you know, those patients are likely to be cured. The recurrence is extremely low. Whereas follicular lymphoma, different story. It's indolent, but they've they're very stubborn, very hard to get rid of them. But after some years, they can come back. If they come back also, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. If they come back with a little lymph node, then we just irradiate it. If there's no disease elsewhere, watch them. Okay, it's basically living the disease for years. Hmm? Absolutely. Um, doctor, I think I, as we come to the end of the session, I don't see any more questions. Please allow me to again, thank you so much for making time on a Saturday morning to speak to all of us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Dr. Ellen Te Kihian, consultant hematologist at Sumajaya Medical Center. And of course, for many of us, the telemedicine god of Malaysia. Uh, I think, yeah, Dr. Ellen has been, I think I, 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 I think a lot of uh, what I, the little uh, bit don't, I don't, don't, don't use the word, don't say that. I think she, the word should be evangelist. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'm an IT uh, evangelist. Evangelist. IT evangelist. evangelist. Uh, and now I'm going to be a silo evangelist. Stop using uh, WhatsApp. Please use okay. silo. It's so secure. Uh, sign up. And then the, you'll be surprised. Uh, you need to get verified on silo. You sign up on silo. You, you, it, silo is a, uh, a Scandinavian uh, company. So it's European. It's not Malaysian. Okay. Uh, but they made it free to use, which is very good. So uh, it works like WhatsApp, very sim sim similar. Uh, but uh, so it should be, you just download Silo. And once you're verified by Team Silo, you just need to send them your MMC number and then upload some ID. So like driving license or something. Then they verify you. Once you're verified, you can search the directory. You can see other Malaysian doctors, other foreign doctors there as well. And then you can message each other. So it's a very secure way. And you don't reveal your private phone number, email, nothing. So it's actually very, very useful. So please sign up with S-I-I-L-O on the App Store or Play Store. Hope to right. see you all that. Uh, hmm. Okay. Lovely, doctor. Um, I was just going to ask you, and I suppose this is, uh, I, I may have super, like how to yeah. say this may be superfluous now, if there's any tips or, you know, last last uh, words to us. But that was the that was the pitch. Yeah, that was the pitch. Yeah. I, I yeah, can't help by throwing something by tea at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, mm. Uh, mm. for joining us this morning. And um, as you all know, uh, me and Dr. Allen will, will sign out um, shortly. And what will happen is my colleague will put on the QR code for you to scan and get the CPD points. Thank you very much for coming on once again. The recording is still available for those of you who joined us uh, midway or you want to rewatch it, please feel free. It's on, on all our websites, social media as well. And you go to the YouTube channel and, and get a hold of it as well. Thank you so much, doctor. And everyone have a nice weekend. And we'll yeah. see you all soon. Thank you, uh, Dr. Morale. Thank you once again, NCSM, for this uh, great opportunity to reach out to primary care doctors, the most important frontliners, I think. And I hope uh, those who watched it benefit from my ramblings. Huh? So <laughs> and uh, I wish everybody a happy weekend. So you all stay safe. Yeah. Okay. So I'll take my leave now. All right. Bye-bye.